Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining our Taylor Mills 7 Day Adventist Church live stream. I forget what week we're on. I don't know if I said week 11 last week or if it's week 12 this week. I'm not even sure what week we're on anymore. But uh, we've been in this for over uh, for over two months now. Um, I think we may be even closing in on, on three months. But, um, but we want to welcome everybody to our Taylor Mill 7 Day Adventist Church live stream. We're so glad that you can join in with us. Um, we have uh, we have our we have our Sabbath school time that's starting here in, in just a few minutes. So we're gonna let Warren take it away, um, and then um, around eleven o'clock we will well at eleven o'clock sharp we will be going into our um, our worship service, which will be a camp meeting hosted uh, worship service. So we'll be live streaming. Um, uh, camp meeting, and then of course next week I'll begin preaching again. Um, so we'll be we'll be starting a, a new series uh, next week. Um, I'm thinking uh, I'm I'm really toying with the idea of discipleship. So we may we may be going that route. But um, but yeah. So our our sermon today is going to be entitled "The Universe Next Door" by Dr. Robert Fol Falkenberg Jr. So make sure to tune in at 11 o'clock. Uh, certainly at 11 o'clock, so that way you can you can you can listen to that. Um, but we have a few announcements that we want to um, that we want to talk about uh, this morning. Um, obviously, you know our church update. We the church building is is staying closed still until until June 13th, um, and we are going to reconvene as a church board during that second Monday of the month, and we're going to assess and, and, and see if we need to keep the church building closed a little bit longer. Um, and I, I, do, I do want to encourage everybody. Look, um, there are people that have opinions one way or the other. Some people have opinions that we should keep the church open, and there are other people that have the opinion that we should keep the church closed for now, that it's not safe to open. Um, I want to let you know that as a leadership, this is, this is not an easy decision, because no matter what decision you make, there's always going to be somebody who is not going to like the decision that you make. Um, so please bear with the leadership. Have, uh, have a little mercy on the leadership as we try to wade through these difficult waters right now. Um, it's, not, it hasn't, it's not easy, but uh, we really haven't gotten really too many of any complaints at all about keeping the church closed because, you know, we feel, we feel right now that it's, it's safe to do so. We don't want to be among some of the first churches to open. Um, there's, there's, there's still a very real threat out there. When will the church open? I'm not sure. Right now, we have it set to open on June 20th, but um, but we're not we're we're still not sure what's going to happen. So please bear with the leadership. Have patience with the leadership as we try to wade through these difficult waters. Um, you know, some churches have decided to open up, and uh, some churches had to close back up and re quarantine because because there were COVID cases in their church. So we're not sure if it originated at their church or if it was brought into their church, and then they were forced to quarantine again. Um, so we want to we want to avoid a situation like that, but we also want to avoid a situation where our church members are are put in a a position where they could get sick and, and could be hurt by this. So we want to do whatever we can to protect to protect you. And when we do start church, just know that we're going to be having guidelines and 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 ways that we can protect our 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 worship service, uh, protect the people in our worship service from from being infected or, or anything like that. So so please just again be patient with our leadership. Um, no matter where you stand on the issue, just know that this is not an easy decision, and we want to make the best decision that's in the best interest for our the people of our church and the community around us, okay? Um, just a quick announcement also on the women's ministry group. Um, that group has finished their final study last week. It was kind of a uh, impromptu decision. Um, um, and so Anna, Anna actually had to start going back to going back to work on, on Tuesdays. So, um, it was, it's been about 10, 11 weeks for that group. That group's been going on. So we thought it was well, you know, it was a good cutoff point anyways. So I'm thinking about starting a group um, on, on either Tuesdays or Thursdays. I will keep you posted as to, as to if that happens and when that will happen. Um, and I'm going to tell you the people that I'm, that I'm looking for. Um, I am looking for, for certain people to join the group. Um, I'm looking for people that, if I do start this group, I'm looking for people that are not just interested in gaining information, right? We're certainly going to be talking about information, but I'm looking for people that want to develop as disciples and disciple makers. That's really who I want to be part of this group. Of course, everybody would be welcome, but this is particularly the people that I'm looking for. I'm looking for people that want to develop as leaders, people that want to develop as a potential group leader at some point in the future. Um, people that we can take under our wing and disciple and move along the discipleship journey into, into that kind of leadership role. 
um, and people who are willing to, to be disciple makers. Um, maybe if you're such person, please make sure to get in contact with me. Um, I'd be, be love to talk with you more about, about, about that process and about being involved in a group that will help you develop into, into a leader, into a person who is a disciple maker. So those are the kind of people that I'm looking for, not just looking for information gatherers. I'm looking for people that want to be disciples of Jesus Christ. Um, and, and I hope that, and I hope that's, that's you. And I hope that's all of you, but, uh, I'll keep you posted as to when, uh, when and how we'll be starting that group. And we'll, certainly it will be done through zoom if I do decide to do it. Um, and we'll get you more information on that. Uh, tonight we're going to be having a white seven thirty. Um, Randy and Sherry Phipps are hosting that. So if you want your child to be involved in a Y, please get in contact with Randy or Sherry and they will get you the zoom information. Um, right now they have a, they have a Sabbath school going on. Um, and so if you want to be involved in that, please get in contact with them and they'll give you the zoom information, uh, for, for our weekly youth Sabbath schools as well. So a Y tonight at seven 30. Also on Wednesdays, Pathfinders at six o'clock, get in contact with uh, Tish Daibo. She'll be, uh, she'll get you the zoom information so you can get connect, get connected on Wednesday nights, every Wednesday at six o'clock PM. Also, tonight um, tonight is going to be our final night of camp meeting, so please make sure to tune in. We are having our camp meeting worship service this morning, but be sure to tune in tonight for our final our final uh, meeting uh, for camp meeting by Robert Falkenberg Jr., um, and that'll be at 7 o'clock uh, Eastern Time uh, tonight, and we'll, that'll be through, you can see that through Facebook, you can see that through the Kentucky Tennessee website or through the Kentucky Tennessee YouTube page, as, uh, as you guys have seen in the email that I've sent. Um, and then final, final announcement today at 430, actually it's going, we're going to be meeting at 415. Um, we are having a kind of drive by drive through baby shower for Donna Ray and Mike. Um, I please, if this is something that you are interested in, uh, get in contact with my wife, Anna Banos or Susan Williams, um, to be involved in this. We're going to be meeting at 415 at a Huntington Bank there um, off of the um, exit of Richwood, I believe it is. Anyways, you'll see it in the looping announcements after Sabbath school. It'll be there towards the end of the looping announcements. So um, look to look for that announcement to loop um, um, when uh, when we go to our when we go to our announcements uh, later on. Um, but we're having a baby shower today and we're going to be driving by Mike and, and Donna Ray's house so we can drop off, we can drop off gifts and just let them know that we're thinking about them, that we love them. So please come on out, show your support. If you don't know enough about the, about the event, please give Anna a call or reach out to Anna, reach out to Susan, whether you call them, text them through Facebook messenger, email, whatever it is. So that way we can be part of this kind of caravan that goes through their house and waves high and hands them gifts. And as we, as we, as we, as we wish them well on their, on their, on their incoming, uh, incoming baby. So, but I think that's all I have for this morning. I also want to let you know that, um, for all of those who are just tuning in now, I want to let you know, that if you have tuned in this morning to the Taylor Mill Seven Day Adventist Church live stream, even when we start church back up, if you come to our church, anytime that you come to our church, you tune into our stream, I want to let you know that you are family. You are part of the Taylor Mill Seven Day Adventist Church family, and you may not tune in for two weeks. You may not tune in for two months. You may not tune in for two years. But the moment that you do tune in and the moment that you do walk through those doors, you are part of the Taylor Mill Seven Day Adventist Church family. Welcome to the family. Let's go ahead and say a word of prayer as we transition over to Warren as he gives us chapter 6 of the Steps to Christ Sabbath School lesson. Father in heaven, we want to thank you so much for all that you do. And Lord, this is, this is a beautiful morning this morning, a beautiful Sabbath. And Lord, we need a Sabbath after the events of this week and some of the injustices that we've experienced, uh, we've seen and witnessed this week, Lord. Help us to be voices for those who are treated unjustly. Help us to stand for those who can't stand for themselves. Help us to be that voice that booms your justice and your mercy to the world, Lord. Help us to be Christians who spread the gospel of love propositionally and practically. Father, as we go into Sabbath school, Lord, I pray that you help us, Lord, to understand a little bit more about faith and acceptance. Use Warren, guide him and direct him, and let us come out of that study better than the way that we walked in. We love you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, family, God bless, and we'll see you here in a few. We're back again, um, back to our book, Steps to Christ, and we're now in chapter 6, I think it is. Let me see. One, two, three, 
Yeah, we're starting on chapter 6 today. Um, chapter 6 is titled Faith and Acceptance. Now, just a quick recap of what we've been doing. Um, we started out with those two foundational truths, right? Number one is that God loves us, right? Um, God's love for man. And we tried to prove that, and I think it's pretty evident that God does love us. The second foundational truth is, uh, the second chapter was the sinner's need of Christ. And you remember, we talked about those those three aspects, the sinner, the need, and Christ. And um, then we transferred into what what I call like this fourfold um um, understanding of what it really means to make those steps to Christ and not only steps to him like initially becoming a Christian but the steps that we maintain with him when we walk with Christ through our life we we keep maintaining these steps and do you remember what those four things were um, the first thing was repentance right we talked about what repentance was a sorrow for sin and a turning away from sin and then we talked about confession what confession is Confession is admitting or agreeing with God that um, what he says is true and, and you know, everything else is not, right? Um, confession. We talked about confessing to God. We talked about confessing um, to other people when we've wronged them. We talked about the confession. It carries with it this, this problem that we have sometimes. It's the problem of humility because you have to humble yourself to confess, to admit that you're guilty and wrong and things like that. And then we talked about Number three, consecration. Consecration, that's what we talked about last time. And consecration was was very um, helpful for me personally. But what is, what is consecration? Remember, I gave you a quick definition, one word. All, right? All in. Um, um, that's what to be consecrated means. It means not being half-hearted about it, um, not being uh, shifty or... or um, holding back uh, something from God, but giving him everything. And you remember what that main thing is that we talked about giving God. We, we, we talked about not really looking at the, the little uh, minute details of life, like your money and your time and things like that. We look at the one prime thing that God is interested in above all things, and that is our heart. That we are to give him unreservedly, consecrate to him our heart. And when we give him our heart, and we allow God to cleanse our heart and to make us new, then everything else comes with it. I mean, we don't we don't worry about anything else. I mean, once someone has your heart, it's kind of like your your first love, you know. Um, once they have your heart, that nobody else can get it, right? I mean, there's there's nobody else that can take it away because you know it's it's gone. It's consecrated to that person. So those are the first three things, and now we're going to close up and talk about the fourth thing. You remember what the fourth thing was? faith. And the title of our chapter is Faith and Acceptance. Because that's really like the capstone of this whole idea of, of how to come to God, how to maintain a relationship with God, how to walk with Christ on a daily basis, like Peter said, following his steps. Um, this is like the capstone, faith and acceptance. And remember, these, these four things, I told you, they're, they're not individual things that you work on one at a time. No, they're, they're a united whole. They all go together to formulate this whole practical, um, um, what it really looks like and feels like to be a Christian. And we also talked about last time that, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of false Christianity out there um, that's really like fluff and marshmallow and it's just nothing, there's nothing substantial to it. It's just not real. Um, when a trial like COVID-19 comes, uh, the people fall away and they give up on God and they curse God and they blame him and, and they don't see any hope in the situation um, because what they have is not real. What we're trying to do um, is teach you about true Christianity, what it really is, biblically speaking, you know, just straight out of the, the, the book, you know, the 66 um, books that make up this thing we call the Bible. Um, what does it say? And repentance, confession, consecration, and today faith are all biblical concepts that make up what we refer to as coming to Christ or being a Christian or following Jesus or um, being saved. Whatever terminology you use and your church uses, it all has to do with these things. Understanding God loves us, understanding that we're sinners, we have a need, Christ fulfills that need, and now uh, I understand that. How do I get to Jesus how do I maintain a walk with Jesus? And that's where these four things we've been talking about come into play. Repentance, confession, consecration today, faith. And faith and acceptance. Um, so what is faith? 
Well, faith is belief. Yeah, yeah. Faith is believing something. It's believing it so much so that you act upon that belief, right? You believe um, that it's going to rain. There's a 100% chance of rain um, if you go out today. The weatherman tells you, take your umbrella, you know, get ready. It, there's a 100% chance. There's no doubt it's going to rain today. Okay, you believe that. You believe that weatherman. Well, it depends on what state you're in, you know. Here in Kentucky, I think if they say there's a 20% chance of rain, get ready, it's going to rain. I mean, it's, if there's a, any chance that it's going to rain in Kentucky, it's there, it's going to rain. Take your umbrella. So what do you do when you, when you, when you have full faith that it is going to rain? What do you do? Well, you prepare for it. You make those necessary steps, right? You get your umbrella. You get you wear your waterproof shoes. You get your raincoat. You know, you make sure that the bicycle is not parked in the garage so that you can get in there so you don't have to walk through the rain to get to your door and so on and so forth. Faith in the Christian perspective is just the same thing. It's believing something and then acting upon it. Faith is an action word. It's something, it's a doing word. That's what we learned in James previous to Steps to Christ. We learned that faith without works is dead. That you, you can't say you have faith if it does not have works behind it. It's not real. It's not true. It's not biblical. Again, that's part of that false Christianity that's out in the world. They say they have faith. They believe. But you don't see any works in their life. It's, it's not true. It's not true biblical faith. I'm sorry. It's just, yeah, it's biblical. It's just what it is. It's not something I make up. I, you know, I wish it was true that you didn't have to do anything to be saved, but that's just not the case. It's ridiculous to even think that. So when I think about faith, and I want to help you to understand it, um, I want you to think about these two concepts, okay? We talked about it a little bit when we talked about repentance, and we talked about David. Um, what did David base his opportunity to repent. How, how did David even know he would have a chance to repent, to turn away from his sin? How did he, what did he base the thought that, you know what, yeah, I deserve death and destruction and judgment, but God might not do that. What did he base that on? You remember it was in Psalm 51. It says it was based on God's loving kindness and mercy. He understood that God was loving and merciful. And so that's what he based it on, that his opportunity to repent. In the book of Acts, the apostle is preaching to the Jewish nation, and he said that um, he said that that through Jesus, God has given uh, uh, Israel repentance. He's giving them um, an opportunity to change their mind, to to go another way. And uh, it's a wonderful thing to know that God will allow us to do that. So the opportunity to Place faith in God, to believe and to act upon what God is saying is founded in God's love and mercy. Okay, we've established that. Now, what is our assurance? What is our assurance that God will do what he will do? It's not the love and kindness and the mercy. That's not where the assurance, that's not where the, the um, that's not where we place our anchor, right? What do we place our belief and our faith, when we do things for God, when we give our lives to Christ, what are we really holding on to? What we're really holding on to is a word called promise. We're holding on to a word called promise. Now, if you have this book, Steps to Christ, or if you've read it online and you've read this faith and accept this cha chapter, you're going to notice a word that is constantly repeated and repeated and repeated in this chapter, and it's the word promise. Many things... Most things that make up the Christian life, the day-to-day -day walking in the footsteps of Jesus are based on faith that rests in promise. Now, what does that mean? What does that mean? It means that we do things and say things and act certain ways and do certain things and, and go here and there. We do those things not based upon an immediate gratification like the like the world wants you know we do the world does things because they want that immediate gratification that immediate pleasure that comes from it the christian life is not like that the christian life we pray sometimes prayers are instantaneously answered yeah i get it uh, people have testimonies i know it's true but not always people read their bible because not because it's going to give them an instantaneous change of life or, or this magnitude of information. But sometimes it does. But sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes you have to read it over and over and over to get it. We go to church. We sacrifice our time and our money. 
And sometimes it we don't get like this immediate like you know God said if we if we tithe we give ten percent of our increase of our income of of all of our increase actually you know um all of our all of the things that we get we tithe off of those we give God that ten percent. It says um. You know, God says, test me in the book of Malachi. You've heard it a thousand times. Test me and see that I don't open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing. Well, I tithe. My family and I, we, we, we tithe off of our income every two weeks when we get paid. I don't expect a, a, a refund check from God in the mail every week. Now, sometimes God does great things. He provides for us in miraculous ways. And it's like, wow, you know, I mean, that must be based on you know, our faith in tithing or whatever. But it's not always. So how do we deal with those not always situations when it comes to your salvation? When you ask God for forgiveness and then you get done praying and you still feel kind of guilty about it. You still kind of feel bad, you know? And there's no emotional attachment. There's no exuberant, joyful feeling that comes with it. How do you know you're forgiven? Maybe since you didn't have that feeling, maybe that just means that God didn't forgive you. Is that true? Well, that's absolutely not true. Because if you repent, if you confess, forsake your sins, God has mercy on you. I mean, but what am I basing that on? Why can I say that with confidence and tell you that? Because we're basing it on a promise. And we're basing it on a promise not from some wishy-washy person, right? Me, you know, I make you a promise and, you know, depending on how much you know me and how good you know me, you you can weigh out. So I think he's good for that promise or Man, there's no way that's going to happen. I don't believe him. Um, but the promises that we're talking about, it's not promises that I've made you or that man has made you. It's promises that come from God. And that's what we base this on. And that is the assurance that, that is where assurance is founded. It's founded on promise. Because if you, if, you, if you take the Bible cut and dry, you will find out that God has promised us one thing above all things. And that's eternal life. Now, when you see a loved one die, you know right quick that eternal life must not be happening right now. Because they died. That physical body, God says we're going to have physical bodies. There's going to be a resurrection, right? We're going to have that. But they just died. So when is that? It's a promise. It is a promise that God has given us. And we base our faith and our life and our dedication, all of these things that we talked about, by, by, by faith we, 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 we grasp that God loves us. Why? Because we have his promises. We read in the Bible that, that God loves us. We, we grasp by faith that the, the sinners need of Christ because we read in the Bible that, that people are sinners. We read in the Bible that we have a real need. We read in the Bible that that Jesus is the fulfillment of that need. We read in the Bible about repentance and confession and consecration. We read that in the Bible and we believe that because there is a promise. There's a reward. We talked about that in the book of James. You remember it says, he who endures temptation will receive the crown of life. Um, or crown of righteousness. I can't remember how he puts it, but that's what he's saying. In the judgment, you'll be found just and righteous because you've endured those temptations. You've stayed faithful. You've, you've maintained that, that, that walk. That's the, that, that step with Christ, you've maintained that and therefore you're going to be rewarded for it. So the opportunity to have salvation, the opportunity to walk with God, to, to, to rebuild, to, to turn back and to rebuild that union, the opportunity is based on God's loving kindness and mercy because that's what he wants for his, for his creation. He wants that. He wants it for me. He wants it for you. But the assurance of that, to know that that's what God wants is based on his promise. Because he said it in his word. And that's what we base it on. We base it on what this book has told us about God. Um, because we believe that this book is the true and accurate record of God's dealing with humanity. So in this chapter, we're going to talk about faith and acceptance. And, and it starts off in the second paragraph by saying this. It is peace that you need. Heaven's forgiveness and peace and love in the soul. And that's where we're trying to get to, right? Not We're not trying to necessarily escape COVID-19 or anything like that. We're, we're attempting to have peace through COVID-19 because 
the majority of the time, God did not take his people away from trials and tribulations. No, he carried them through that. You think about those three Hebrew boys. He didn't save them from the fiery furnace. He saved them through the fiery furnace. He didn't save Daniel from the lion's den. He saved Daniel through the lion's den. He didn't save Noah from the flood. He saved Noah through the flood. You understand what I'm saying? This is over and over and over. We find that those people who truly have faith in God, who trusted and believed in God and acted in accordance to what they knew and they believed, they were kept through the situation. See, that's hard for me because when I pray and I have a, a bad day and I have a situation, a trial come up, I'm like, God, get rid of the trial. No, I'm going to carry you through the trial. Stay faithful through the trial. Then when you get on the back side of that trial, you'll learn something. You'll be a better Christian. It's like, oh, man. I got to endure through it then. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's what we're called to do as Christians. We talked about it last week um, um, or, or the week before, one of the weeks. They're kind of getting a little jumbled now. But we talked about that. It is a struggle. Consecration. We talked about it last week. Consecration. That consecration is a struggle because we don't want to give everything to God. We don't want him to have our whole heart. We want to keep some stuff in reserve. And we don't want to do that. And it is a struggle to do that. That's, that's part of the endurance of being a Christian, of, of taking steps to Christ. It is peace that we need. Heaven's forgiveness and peace and love in the soul. And the Bible gives us a wonderful, pro, a wonderful promise about that. And it's uh, Romans chapter 5. Write it down if you want. Um, it says, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Justified. Remember, we talked about that last week. Just as if I had never sinned. Sin is forgiven through Christ, through our through our belief and our acceptance and our following of Jesus. We have been justified by that faith, believing in Him, trusting in Him, based on the promises that God will forgive us if we will follow Him, and therefore we have peace with God. The promise of God. You have peace with Him. There's no enmity. We're not in at odds with God anymore. That 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 union that was broken in the garden has now been restored when we. Place our faith in Christ and come to Him. The book says, You have confessed your sins and in heart put them away. You have resolved to give yourself to God. Now go to Him and ask that He will wash away your sins and give you a new heart. Then believe that He does this because He has promised. It's based on promise. We do a lot of things based on promises, right? Based on the trust of somebody's word. You do a lot of stuff, you know? You elect officials to your government because of their promises when they're campaigning. I promise to lower taxes or do this or that. And so you vote for them, right? And then they let you down. God's made promises for your salvation, for your eternity. And God can't lie. And therefore, he won't let you down because he can't. It's an impossibility for God to let you down. The, uh, the, the, the book gives us quite a few examples of, of people acting in faith and the result of that faith. Their prayers are answered. Um, Jesus, when he came on this earth to prove his ministry, to prove that he was the Son of God and that he was the Savior of the world and the Messiah to the Jewish nation and, and to us as well, um, the Savior of all, when he came, he did a lot of miracles, like physical miracles, so people could actually see what he was doing and know that God was working through him and believe on him, right? And so he, he did a lot of those physical those physical healings and things like that. And um, one of the one of the men that he healed it, it was a paralytic, a, a paralyzed man, and they they let the man down, and and Jesus looked at the man and uh, he healed him, and he told him to take up his bed and walk. And this uh, the sick man. Um, I might be jumbling up my accounts here, but I want you to notice what he said to this man, whether it was the paralytic or, or the man by the, the well or by the, yeah, by the well. He says, but no, he believed Christ's words, believed that he was made whole and he made the effort at once. He willed to walk and he did walk. He acted on the word of Christ and God gave the power and he was made whole. So this man, whichever healing it was, there's multitudes of them in the Bible. This man, when, when Christ gave the word, he believed in his word and he received um, because he had faith in his word. The word of God is what we have to base our belief on. We have to base our faith on it. That's what we have. Um, you can ask for miracles and you can ask for visual um, signs from God, but most of the time you're not going to get that. And the reason is, is because that's not necessarily going to convince you. If it would, 
you would have thought the Pharaoh of Egypt would have been convinced after plague number nine, <laughs> nine signs from God, that God was God and he should listen to God. But after nine mir miraculous things that happened right before his eyes, he still was hard-hearted against God. It, you, you, you can't have that. It, it, it doesn't work. Some people get to see miracles, and that's great, fine, well, and good. But I'm saying you don't bank your faith in what you do and how you react to God based upon a, a, a visual uh, inspection of a miracle. No, you, you, you base it upon the promise of God's word. What has he said? If he has said it, then it's good. It says, in like manner, we are sinners. We can't atone for our past sins, we can't change our hearts, and we can't make ourselves holy. But God promised to do all of this for us through Christ. You believe the promise, you confess your sins, give yourselves to God, you will to serve Him. And just as surely as you do this, God will fulfill His word to you. If you believe the promise, believe that you are forgiven and cleansed. And listen to this statement, I love this statement. God supplies the fact. You believe it, God supplies the fact. It is what it is because he said it is, right? I mean, that, that's it. You are forgiven, not because I think you're forgiven, not because the pastor says you're forgiven, not because of this, that, or the other thing. You're forgiven in your own mind and heart because God has told you you're forgiven. You, 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 you've done what he said. You've come to his son. You've made steps to Christ. You've repented. You've confessed. You, you are, you're consecrating as best you can at this very moment. And you have placed faith in Jesus. And because of that faith, that's where that second part of the title comes. You know that you're accepted because God has promised it. And that's where the peace comes in. That's where the joy comes in is because you, you know you're accepted of God. You know that if life is over and it's all said and done, if COVID-19 were the last thing that happens on this earth and Jesus comes back, you're ready to receive him because you want him to come. You're loving to, you're, you're love, you would love his appearing. You would love for him to come because you're ready to be with him forever because of what he's done for you, and you're ready to be with those holy beings. You're ready to be in that kingdom of purity and holiness with, with all the other beings that are pure and holy. God supplies those facts. Do not wait to feel that you're made whole, but say, I believe it, and it is so, not because I feel it, but because God has promised. Remember, feelings come and go with the wind. You eat some bad Mexican food, guess what? You don't feel too great, right? You don't feel too holy or faithful. You, you, you kind of feel, you feel bad, right? Uh, it, it, it's hard to be faithful when, when you don't feel faithful, but we can't base it on feelings. Remember love? We talked about love. Love is not just a feeling. Sometimes you don't feel like you love somebody, but if you base it on how you feel, then you wouldn't be a Christian because love is more than that. Love is a commitment. It's, it's all those things that we've talked about. Now that you've given yourself to Jesus, do not draw back. Do not take your way, yourself away from him, but day by day say, I am Christ. Remember last week we talked about these things, this repentance, confession, consecration, and faith. These are not some things that you do one time and it's a done deal. No, no, this is the walk. This is following Jesus. Jesus, when he walked on our earth, he, these are the steps that he took. You know, he, he took these, these necessary steps of, of, of following um, after these concepts of um, the, the whole consecration, man, he was just totally given over to God. I mean, uh, he didn't have to confess sin because he didn't have any sin. Um, he didn't have anything to repent of. But remember, God had to treat him like he was a sinner. So during his, his trial and or his the whole Garden of Gethsemane experience all the way to the cross, you know, Jesus, he had to trust in God and believe in God just like you and I do. And so Day by day, Jesus was walking by faith. He was praying. Constantly, we see Jesus praying to God. We see him reaching out to the Father. We see him testifying of God. We see him enduring the trials and the tribulations that come and remaining faithful through them um, because that's what it is. It's a day-to-day -day thing. We don't do it one time and it's a done deal. The apostle says, as you have therefore received Christ Jesus, the Lord, so walk in him. So the apostle Paul tells us in Colossians chapter uh, 2 and verse 6, he says, just like you received Jesus, because there's some of you right now, you're going to receive him or you're just new receiving him. You're just now getting, you're, you're, you're finding these steps to Christ. After that, you have those steps with Christ. You walk with him. And the apostle Paul says, just like you received him, 
You received him through understanding God's love, understanding you're a sinner and you have a need in Christ for the fulfillment of that need, understanding the, the repentance and confession and consecration and faith and acceptance, understanding all of that. He said, just as you have started with Jesus this way, so walk that way. So continue on. It's a continual. Like we said last week, this is a lifestyle change. It's not just something that 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 we do one time and then we go back to the way we were. No, that, that's what most people that's what false Christianity teaches. You live like you want to, and you can still be saved. That's, that's not true. It's just silly to even think that. I, I don't even entertain a, 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 a debate about that because it's, it's just silly. It, just, uh, it doesn't even make sense. Put away the suspicion that God's promises are not meant for you. The book warns us. Don't think that this applies to somebody else. Okay? Don't think that this applies to this person and that person, but not to you and not to me. Because it's individual. God so loved the world and you're part of the world. They are for every repentant transgressor. These promises that we can take hold of, that can give us the peace and the joy, the assurance of eternal life, these things are for every repentant transgressor. Every person who has, up to this point, all of those chapters we've talked about, come to that point and made that, that true heartfelt turn toward Christ, these promises, the promises of God are for us forgiveness of our sins, a new life, the Holy Spirit guiding and directing us, uh, and ultimately eternal life in the kingdom. God does not deal with us as finite men deal with one another. His thoughts are thoughts of mercy, love, and tenderest compassion. He says, let the wicked forsake his ways, the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. I have blotted out as a thick cloud thy transgressions and as a cloud thy sins. That's Isaiah 55. In Isaiah 44, this is the Old Testament God saying, hey, I don't want you to sin. I want you to turn back and come to me. I'm, I'm ready to forgive you. I'm ready to blot out your transgressions. That's what I want. I don't want you to, to, to be lost in your sins. Turn from your unrighteousness. You remember the, the story of the prodigal son? Some of you do. It's in the Bible. It's in the book of Luke um, chapter 15. He gives us a good understanding of, of God's heart toward people. Um, there was a son who lived at home with his father. He had everything right there at his fingertips. You know, he had a great life and a good family. And, and he wanted to go out and, and sow his wild oats and, and try out the world. And the Bible tells us that he goes and he spends everything and he, he winds up in the hog pen, you know, slopping the hogs. I mean, he lost all of his money. He lost all of his friends. He was alone and he was at the lowest of the low. And then the Bible says, and then he came to himself. He had this little spark of, of hope that came to his mind. He says, you know what? If I go, if I turn and go back home and just tell my dad that, you know, I'm not worthy to be called your son. I mean, I totally blew it. I don't even deserve to be called that. Just make me as a, a servant in your house. And he says, then I'll have food to eat at least and I'll have a home. And he says, you know, I'm resolved. That's what I'll do. And he goes back with that mentality that I'm not worthy of anything. I'm, I just, I'm just looking for a little mercy. And it says the father saw the son coming from a long way off and he ran out to meet him. And the son immediately begins repentance and confession and, and consecration and faith and pours it out. Father, I don't, I don't expect to be taken back as a son. Just make me as a servant. And it's like the father doesn't even hear that. The father does not even respond to that. Immediately, the father, he has the son, and he's just yelling out orders to his servants. Go get the best robe. Go kill the fatted calf. Put a ring on his finger. Put shoes on his feet. The father doesn't even take notice. All he knew was that his son who was lost had came back, and that was all that mattered. He knew that his son was back, and he wanted to take care of his son. So much more God. All of us by creation, our children of God, in, in, a certain, in a certain way, right? We're, we're all created beings and God loves every human being that's ever been born because he is the one that initiated our creation, right? I know your mom and dad made you and you made your kid and so on and so forth. But as a part of God's creation, we are all valuable in his sight and he wants to redeem all of us, black, white, fat, skinny, young, old, he doesn't care. He wants to redeem the animals. He wants to redeem the earth. He wants to get rid of the thorns and the this. He wants to do all of that. And that's what he's working toward. That's what the Bible tells us about. 
And so when we come to him, just like this son came to his father saying, you know what, God, I know I'm not even worthy to even ask you anything because of the life that I've lived. But if you would just show me just a tiny bit of mercy, just, just enough mercy to allow me to get in just as a servant, I will be at the bottom rung of the ladder. I don't expect a throne. I don't care about a mansion. I don't care about a, a white robe and a gold crown. I don't care about any of that. Just being in your kingdom, in your presence, is all that I want. When that's our heart, how do you think God, our Heavenly Father, reacts to us? When we show that amount of faith, and we have promises to back it up in the Bible that we will be accepted, we can have that assurance of, of, of our salvation based on those promises. With the rich promises of the Bible before you, can you give place to doubt? You can't doubt it. It's just, there's no place for doubt. Don't, don't listen to people. Don't listen to that the devil pop up on your shoulder trying to tell you. No. If you fulfill what we've talked about in these, these first five chapters, six chapters, if you understand that and you make that effort, your salvation is, is assured based on the promise of God. Not because I say you're saved or, or the pastor says you're saved or your husband or wife or your, you know, whatever says you're saved. It's because God says you are. Can you believe that when the poor sinner longs to return, longs to forsake his sin and the Lord sternly, uh, did that the Lord sternly withholds from him coming to his feet in repentance? When somebody really wants to come to God and turn their life around, do you think God turns them away? Jesus, I told you, we repeated this over and over. Jesus said, if anybody will come to me, I will in no wise cast them out. I'm not turning anyone away. You knock on my door, hey, you're coming in and we're going to talk about it. We're going to fix this thing. That's what he's here for. He came to seek and to save the lost. So anytime there's a lost person out there, Jesus is like a hound dog. He's going around finding him, trying to draw him to salvation. Away with such thoughts. Nothing can hurt your own soul more than to entertain such a conception of our heavenly father that he would withhold anything good from you. That's a crazy thought. Don't ever let it come into your mind. He hates sin, yes, but he loves the sinner, yes. And he gave himself in the person of Christ that all who might be saved, um, so that all who would might be saved and have eternal blessedness. Look up, you who are doubting and trembling, for Jesus lives to make intercession for us. Thank God for the gift of his dear son and pray that you may not have to have, and pray that he may not have died in vain. The Spirit invites you today, come with your whole heart to Jesus and you may claim his blessing. As you read the promises, remember that they are expressions of unutterable love and pity. The great heart of the infinite of infinite love is drawn toward the sinner with boundless compassion. We have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Ephesians 1 7. Yes, only believe that God is your helper. He wants to restore his moral image in man. As you draw near to him with confession and repentance, he will draw near to you with mercy and forgiveness. That is what faith is. It is believing that. And it is acting in accordance with that. And it is based on the promises of God. You have his word to back up your faith, right? You don't need anything else. God's word is all that you need. So I hope that um, I hope that you've been encouraged by this. Those were those fourfold things. You know, once we laid those two foundational bedrocks that God loves you and that we're sinners in need and Christ fulfills that need, how do we get to that point? Those four things, boom, 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 boom. Those four things, that repentance and confession, that consecration and faith, all of that leads to that one big word, acceptance, in that last chapter that we just read. Acceptance. We are accepted into the beloved when we believe these things and we act upon these things. And we maintain our relationship with Christ through these things. Um, never will you not need to practice faith and, and, and repentance and confession and um, consecration. All of these things are, are part of the daily life of the Christian. These are commonplace words now in our life, you know, because sometimes, you know, we might snip at somebody or think something and, you know, we say, God, I'm sorry, you know, forgive me for that. And we, we, we do these things and that just makes up our life. And we we're day to day, we're changed into the image of God. That's what the book says. It says God is wanting to remake his moral image in us. Um, and that's what we're doing on a daily basis. We're, we're becoming more and more like him. I mean, he was our, he's our savior and he's our Lord. He's also our example. 
Um, he's like the perfect man, you know. It's it, it, we're all trying to conform um, to his image, and he helps us to do it. That's what God wants for us, all of us to be like Jesus, you know. I mean, I might not have a, a you know cool long hair like this guy does, but he wants me to have his moral image. And that's what makes us different from everything else in creation, you know. Um, God has given us this mind and this understanding that we are moral beings and that there's a moral law and that, that, that there's a moral God who created this stuff and that he governs through that moral law. And we broke that moral law and we fall, fell from it and we run from it and we break it. And God is like, I want to help you to, to, to get back to that, to get back to obeying and keeping that. Not based on fear and uh, of being punished, but let me show you how much I love you and how what great lengths I'm going to to save you. And then I want you to make a decision. Reason it out. Think about it. And then make a decision. Do you want to keep going like you're going? Well, you can do that. You're not forced to change. You can do that, but just realize what the end result is. Or do you want to make a change? Do you want to make a change and... I've got, I've got a lot of promises in here for you. I'm, uh, I'm telling you left and right what I'll do for you if, if, if you'll make that change and what lies ahead for you. Um, make a choice, you know, choose what you want to do. Choose this day whom you will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Who, who said that? Joshua? Again, that's Old Testament. I'm not very good at that. But thank you for listening. I'm going to have a closing prayer with you. And um, I, I, I hope that that this is strengthening strengthening your walk with Jesus through this time of trial. We really need to be close to him. We really need him through this um, because he's the only one that won't fail us, right? And even if this ends in the worst possible way, even if this turns out to be just the worst possible scenario, when we make this step to Christ and we give our life to him and we start following him, we have that one overarching promise above all the other promises that come is that we will have a home in the eternal kingdom and God will give us eternal life in that. There won't be any disease or viruses there. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for the time we could spend together. Please bless the people that are hearing and listening. And um, God, may we all put our faith and trust in you and believe based on the promises of God that we have the acceptance of our Heavenly Father, and of our Savior. And we pray in His name. Amen. All right. Thank you so much, Warren, for being willing to continue on with Sabbath School. Um, we're going to continue our study next week um, with uh, Steps to Christ, and Warren will we'll have, a, we'll have a few more... Um, a few more chapters left to, to do for us, but um, we're going to go ahead and transition over to our to our announcements, um, our looping announcements. So um, go ahead, go get some food, get a drink, do what you got to do. We'll take a we'll take about a ten minute break, and then we'll be back here. I don't know, maybe in about eight minutes or so, because I'm just going to give a few preliminary comments, and then we'll just launch right into our um, our worship service given to us by the Kentucky Tennessee Conference Camp Meeting. So. Again, Warren already closed us off with prayer, so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna close this up there. But um, go ahead and, and and take a little break, and then we'll be back here in about eight minutes. All right? God bless.
second meeting with the Kentucky Tennessee Conference. Sit down with the family and tune in live and get ready for three powerful speakers as they speak on different biblical topics, as they are guided by the word. Dr. Gordon Beat, former president of the Southern Adventist University. The word from the beginning. The word brings unity. Assistant to the president of the General Comfort, Mike Ryan, will be speaking on Bible heroes guided by the word. The apostolic church guided by the word. The reformers guided by the word. Adventist pioneers guided by the word. God's last day church guided by the word. President of the Chinese Union, Robert Falkenberg Jr. will be speaking on understanding the time the universe next door, our blessed hope. I want to welcome each and every one of you to our final day of our virtual camp meeting of 2020. I hope you've enjoyed this week. I know that there's been some precious messages given to us, and I pray that this challenges all of us to go deeper into the Word of God like never before. I pray that it doesn't just stop right here at camp meeting, but every day we dig into the Word of God. I'm so glad you could be with us this morning, and uh, I just want to let you know about our speaker that's going to be speaking this morning and again tonight at 7 o'clock. His name is Robert Falkenberg Jr. He's currently the president of the China Union. He has earned advanced degrees in religion and ministry from Southern University and Andrews University. He has served across the United States, has a pastor and ministerial director since 1990. He has authored two books, Health for the Harvest and Getting Back to Adventism. His message for today is Understanding the Times. I'm looking forward to hearing his message. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this camp meeting. It's been different than anything we've ever done before or seen, but I pray that your Holy Spirit might be poured out on Pastor Robert Folkenberg Jr. I thank you for his, his commitment and his wife's commitment, Audrey, to the work of God and their work there in China. I pray that all over the world, not just in China, but everywhere, that people People will embrace your message for this time. Help us to love you like we've never loved you before and love your people that you died for, everybody on this planet. For we ask it in Jesus' sweet and holy name. Amen. Reserved for our walk in this world, they resound with God's own heart. Oh, let the ancient words impart words of life, words of hope, give us strength, help us cope in this world. Where'er we roam, ancient words will guide us home. Ancient words ever true, changing me and changing you. We have come with open hearts, oh let the ancient words impart. Of our faith 
handed down to this age come to us through sacrifice oh heed the faithful words of Christ holy words long preserved for our walk in this world and they resound with God's own heart, oh, let the ancient words impart. Ancient words ever true, changing me and changing you. We have come with open hearts, oh, let the ancient words impart. Ancient words ever true, changing me and changing you. We have come with open hearts, oh, let the ancient words impart. Ancient words ever true, changing me and changing you. We have come with open hearts, oh, let the ancient words impart. Ancient words ever true, changing me and changing you. We have come with open hearts, oh, let the ancient words impart. We have come with open hearts, oh, let the ancient words impart. One of my favorite hymns has always been the hymn, It Is Well With My Soul. The song has always spoke to me of the assurance we have in Christ regardless of what may be taking place around us. However, it wasn't until recently that I read more about the history of the hymn and what precipitated the writing of the hymn. The words are written by Horatio Spafford. Horatio Spafford knew something about life's unexpected challenges. He was a successful attorney and real estate investor who lost a fortune in the great fire, Chicago fire of 1871. Around the same time, his beloved four-year-old son died of scarlet fever. Thinking a vacation would do his family some good, he sent his wife and four daughters on a ship to England, planning to join them after he finished some pressing business at home. However, while crossing the Atlantic Ocean, the ship was involved in a terrible collision and sunk. More than 200 people lost their lives, including all four of Horatio Spafford's precious daughters. His wife, Anna, survived the tragedy. Upon arriving in England, she sent a telegram to her husband that began, Saved alone, what shall I do? Horatio immediately set sail for England. At one point during his voyage, the captain of the ship, aware of the tragedy that had struck the Spafford family, summoned Horatio to tell him that they were now passing over the spot where the shipwreck had occurred. As Horatio thought about his daughters, words of comfort and hope filled his mind, and he wrote them down, and they have since become words we know to the well-beloved hymn, When peace like a river attends my way, when sorrow like sea billows roll, Whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Are you or someone you know facing unexpected challenges in life right now? I think all of us have faced changes and adjustments as a result of the ongoing pandemic. Some of you may be facing very direct impacts as a result of the COVID-19, whether you are physically sick or a loved one of yours is is very sick or has even um, 
succumb to, to the illness that is around us. I'm reminded in, in, in difficult times and in challenges, when we look to scripture and we look to characters of the past, the incredible strength that they drew from their faith, being able to press forward and being able to know where their assurance was, just as Horatio Spafford knew, to be able to write the incredible words that he did to this hymn. And so whatever you may be facing, I pray that we will be able to have that assurance and faith that Horatio Spafford did when he penned those words to it as well with my soul. With my soul. I want to leave you with some words from Isaiah chapter 41, verse 10, where the Bible reads, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. As we return our tithe and offerings this morning, returning our tithe and offerings is another act of total total faith and trust in God, total surrender to him and his, and him leading us going forward. As we return them this morning, we continue to emphasize uh, returning to our local church, wherever we may attend. We can do that by um, giving to our local church budget or giving to a specific ministry that our local church has that is impacted that is helping and impacting those affected by COVID-19. As a reminder, you can give by going on to adventistgiving.org, finding your local church and giving through there, or by going to your local church's website and giving online there. Or you can give a check to your local church treasurer by mailing it to your church or mailing it to your treasurer. I pray that the Lord will bless you um, this Sabbath and may you pray with me as we ask the Lord's blessing upon the offering this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you that every good and perfect gift comes from you. We thank you that you are with us in times that are good and in times that are difficult. We, we all face uncertain times, not knowing what may come our way from one day to the next. But Lord, we keep our eyes on you. Help us to keep our eyes on you, to trust you fully in all things of our lives, including returning our tithes and offerings. We pray your blessing upon that which is given today, that your work may continue to go forward as we await your soon return. We love you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining the 2020 Kentucky, Tennessee Virtual Camp Meeting. You are invited to open your Bibles to 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18. 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18 reads as follows. Therefore, we do not lose heart, but though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. For momentary, light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. While we look at the things which are which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal.
Good morning and uh, greetings from this side of the Pacific. I am speaking to you from uh, Hong Kong, China at the offices of our Chinese Union. And uh, I reckon that you are somewhere in either Kentucky or Tennessee joining this virtual camp meeting. And I am truly delighted and honored to be able to, to join you uh, from this side of the world. Though I'll be honest with you, I was looking forward to being a little closer, being there on the campus of Highland and being able to enjoy the beauty of uh, Tennessee and to see many of you friends face to face. But as you know very well, our world has changed dramatically since the first invitation was received to come and be your speaker a couple of years ago. Things are never, we never would have imagined that things would be as they are right now. But you know what? COVID-19 continues to wreak havoc around the world, lots of pain, lots of uncertainty. The ripple effects, as you know, are affecting pocketbooks and bank accounts and pension funds and uh, payrolls, and uh, we don't know where it will end. But today, I'd like to invite you. I'd like to invite you in the midst of the uncertainty, uh, in the midst of this sense that things are, are, are not normal and they might never be normal again, uh, in the midst of, of wondering what this portends, I'd like to invite you to be reminded afresh that with Christ by your side, you do not need to fear this crisis or any other that is to come, and that he is the king of the kingdom of God, and that he is coming very soon. Let's pray together before we start. Uh, but before I pray, I invite you to go and find your Bible. Don't know where you might keep it, but go get it. Let's study together. And let's invite the Holy Spirit now to bless us with his presence. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you so much that in Christ, we are part of your great family. And you have family members scattered throughout this world, all of them facing uncertainty, all of us going through difficult times, but all of us having your hand in ours and ours in yours, knowing that you will be with us even unto the end of time. And this is wonderful. So today, Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit will guide me as I speak, that you will touch the hearts and uh, open the hearts of those who are listening, that we will see clearly and be reminded afresh of the great universe next door. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, the worldview that we each have affects everything that we do. In fact, it affects how we think, how we organize our thoughts, how we define reality. That's what worldview is. In fact, at the base of every culture is a foundational worldview on which everything that you and I call culture, you and I call uh, reality is built. Let me just give you an example before you write this off as just a, a another saying. Uh, by that I mean, oh yeah, that is true. I knew about worldview, but let me explain to you how deeply rooted worldview is in everything that we do. So for example, in my part of the world, when you come to a home, uh, or even a church in some of the countries in the Northern Asia region, you must take off your shoes. You take off your shoes before you go into the house. You take off your shoes before you go into cer certain churches and uh, you put them away. I'm never worried about losing my shoes because my shoes are, are quite a bit bigger than everybody here being six, six foot six. But I've been to churches where there are hundreds of little cubicles and everybody puts their shoes in and goes in the church. Why? Why is it that people take their shoes off before they go into the house or into churches? In the, my part of the world, there are certain restaurants that you sit on the floor. In my part of the world, in certain countries, you sleep on the floor. What's up with this? It's because of our worldview. You see, to those who live in this part of the world, the floor in a home, the floor in a church, the floor in a restaurant is clean. So therefore, you take off your shoes. That's why you could sleep on the floor. That's why you can eat on the floor. In fact, if you think about it, in the American worldview and in the Western worldview, we have viewed the floor as dirty. That is why there is an entire 
industry called the furniture industry to get us up off the floor. We build chairs, we build sofas, we build uh, um, uh, beds. When you go into auditoriums, you have uh, pews or chairs. All of this, why do we do this? It's because we got to get up off the floor. Why do we get off the floor? Because the floor is dirty. I mean, you know what I'm talking about. When I was a kid, if you uh, dropped that precious piece of candy and it was on the floor for less than, is it three or five seconds? <clears throat> Maybe it depends on what part of the country you're from. The five second rule, you can eat it. But why is this five second rule there? Because we believe that if that piece of chocolate is on the floor longer than five seconds, it will get the cooties, it will get germs. You cannot eat it anymore. That's worldview. It affects even the furniture that you right now are sitting on. Your worldview also affects how you eat. I remember when I first came to Asia, sat down at a round table, and in front of me was a bowl, and, and everything is eaten over here in a small bowl that you can put in your hand about this big. And then they give me two sticks to eat with. And the two sticks, uh, they call quites, uh, the two sticks, you're supposed to eat everything with these two sticks from this little bowl and you finish eating and then you refill the bowl and you refill the bowl. And it's completely different than where I came from in the United States where they give you a large plate and a small shovel and you fill it up and you eat usually as quick as you can and then you're done. In this part of the world, they give you a small bowl so you have to keep refilling it. They give you two sticks, so you take your time eating, especially those little grains of rice, and you spend the time socializing, building friendships and relationships. So much of the Asian culture, business, relationships, all takes place around the meal. Totally different. Americans created the fast food industry. Here, to eat is to build relationships. It affects even what you eat. You know, I remember, and I've seen this many times since, when we first moved to, to China, we went to a night market and we were going through and, and looking for some great uh, fried uh, tofu or some fried uh, noodles or rice. And we came across a big jar sitting on a table and it was full of, of living scorpions. And we saw a gentleman come up and he said to the, the people, the guy on the other side of the table, So each of those scorpions was four renminbi and he said, oh, I'll take three of them. So they took, took them out one by one with some very long chopsticks, skewered them, put them into the deep frying oil. And we sat there in awe as they were pulled out, they were salted and the man in front of us sat there and crunched away at him thinking it was wonderful. I don't know of any place in the United States, any McDonald's or Taco Bell that at this point has deep fried scorpions to eat. Just a different mentality. You see, in this part of the world, sometimes these, these critters have medicinal qualities. But the reason I'm telling you this is that worldview defines what we eat, how we dress, how we sit, where we sit, everything. Your worldview will also affect how you perceive animals. Up until the fateful day that Balaam was offered that massive paycheck to go and curse those troublesome Israelites, Balaam always viewed a donkey as being a rather stupid animal, one that would help him get from point A to B, one that would help him carry heavy loads. But if you take your Bibles and turn with me to Numbers chapter 22, you will find an interesting story that totally changed Balaam's worldview. There in, in Numbers chapter 22, we see the story of, of Balaam being tempted to come and follow uh, these people who wanted to bring a curse upon the Israelites. And God said, no, you cannot go. Finally, he was overcome with greed and he got on that donkey, donkey and followed after uh, the men wanting desperately to get the payback. 
But when time and time again, as he was trying to catch up with the king's emissaries, the beast of burden, who had always been faithful, who had always followed his every command, veered this way and veered that way, and finally veered right into a wall and crushed his leg. Balaam was angry and he got off his donkey and he took his stick and he started pounding and hitting this animal before he could even catch himself. He was in a full-flung argument with his donkey. You remember the story. God's angel blocked away. And finally, seeing this angel, Balaam's donkey sat down under him and would not move. And there, in that place, Balaam lost his temper and beat the donkey. And God gave the donkey speech, you remember? And the donkey said to Balaam, what have I ever done to you that you have beat me these three times? Balaam responded, because you have been playing games with me. If I had a sword, that's what the Bible says, I would take it and I would kill you with it. (laughs) The donkey said to Balaam, am I not your trusty donkey on whom you've ridden for years right up until now? Have I ever done anything like this to you before? Have I? And Balaam there having a conversation with a donkey had to agree. No, you haven't. Then God, the Bible says there in Numbers 22, helped Balaam see, opened his eyes to what was truly going on. And he saw God's angel blocking the way and he was brandishing a sword. The Bible says that Balaam fell to the ground. His face was in the dirt as his eyes were open to the universe next door. Balaam had forgotten his calling. He had fallen for the flattery of men. He had succumbed to the cunning influence of the coin. He had thrown everything away about what he knew of the invisible kingdom and only focused on the visible kingdom. You know, and I love this story because it cuts right to the heart of our challenge in living life today. We are so easily consumed by the universe that envelops us, that we forget, as James Sire states so well in his book on worldviews, that we forget the universe next door. And that is the universe, my dear brother and sister, that really counts. It's the universe that really matters. Jesus came to this world to announce, to proclaim, to broadcast far and near that the universe next door now was the universe that was ready to welcome sojourners from this earth, disciples of the Christ, the king of this new kingdom into his everlasting kingdom. We are called as a church to let people know in this world that what we see is not where eternal peace and reconciliation takes place, but rather it's the universe next door. It is the kingdom of God that Jesus came to proclaim that gives us hope, that gives us connection to eternity. And so the call of your Savior is to live a totally sold out life for the sake of the King and his kingdom, is it not? To dedicate your God-given gifts, to dedicate your energies and your experience and to dedicate everything to the all-consuming cause of building and expanding, expanding the kingdom of light, this kingdom of good, this kingdom of love and hope and life. That is what we're called for as a church, especially at the end of time today, surrounded by uncertainty. We are called to proclaim and to expand the kingdom of God. So the call of our Savior is to live a totally sold out life. What I'm saying is that God is calling you to be an engineer for Christ. He's calling you to be a nurse for Christ. He's calling you to be a foreman for Christ, a construction worker for Christ, a teacher for Christ. I Put whatever you wish. But no matter what it is that you 
are doing as a vocation, God has also given you the wonderful, exciting call and adventure to point people to the kingdom of God and the coming of the king who is coming very, very, very soon. This is our calling as a church. You know, it's also to allow the pervasive, all-consuming reality of the king and his kingdom to dictate everything that we do. All that you say to guide all the decisions that you make should be guided and influenced by the universe next door. Then and only then, I believe, will this church truly grow and explode because we will find that when we have the biblical worldview, the fire in our soul will burn bright, passionately. The love for the king will constrain us so that we cannot help but live and share the love of the king. Let me come back again to this issue of the worldview. We must ask our master Jesus every day to open our eyes so that we can see, so that we can perceive, so that we can hear the still small voice, so that we can perceive with spiritual eyes and ears the cacophonous sounds of the great controversy that are around us, that surround us in our daily living. But we sometimes just, just, just are blind to them. We think that this is just normal, but actually we are in the midst of a great controversy between good and evil, between light and darkness. It's raging around us between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan. And if we would open our eyes, we can see this happening all around us. And you can see it clearly now with this thing called COVID-19 that is indiscriminately taking young and old, innocent people. That's the random ugliness of sin. We are living in a time of pestilence because the father of pestilence is at work. If it were not, I believe for the grace of God, it would be much worse. But we are still living in this time of, of, of battle. In this time of battle, we need to open our eyes and see that our king is by our side. And though there will be difficulties, and though we go through dark times, the ultimate victory of the king is certain. It's certain. Why do we know this? Because our eyes are open to the spiritual reality. Here's the question for today then. Here is the issue I might say at hand. Will you seize the adventure that God has called you to, to live for the king there in Kentucky, there in Tennessee? Or will your gaze be riveted only on the things of this word, world, which are merely seen today and then disappear tomorrow, forgotten? Oh, I love the way that Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 points us to this universe next door. Take your Bibles that you went and got. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16. And I'm reading from the New King James Version. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Are you feeling discouraged? Are you feeling overwhelmed? Paul is saying to you, we do not lose heart. But why? Do we not lose heart? What are the grounds for this hope? Paul answers that. Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day as we are walking with Christ, as we are daily filled with this Holy Spirit, as we're spending time in his word, we are becoming changed into the likeness of Christ. His grace is saturating every cell of our body, changing our our character into his likeness. He says, we are being renewed, it says, day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. That's verse 16. Now look at verse 17. For our light affliction, I'm sorry, verse 18. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Yes, we're going through light afflictions or maybe heavy afflictions. And we know that this is just for a time, but the things which are not seen, oh, those are eternal. The kingdom of God, the kingdom 
of God that surrounds us in Christ Jesus through his Holy Spirit, that is what is eternal. The greatest need I believe in my life daily and in the life of our church is for us to live lives fully consumed with this kind of worldview, that of Christ and of his kingdom. That when we wake up in the morning, we realize that we're not just going to work or going down to Home Depot to buy some things to fix up, fix up something in the garage. No, no, no. Yeah, these are important. We need to do those things. But as we do them, we are living with the worldview that says we are ambassadors of Christ here now, sent out by God to be his ambassadors for the kingdom of light, the kingdom of God and the king is coming, we got to let people know. We need to preach this three angels message. We need to share the hope that we have. And I believe that if we have this kind of worldview, it will affect everything, everything that we do, every decision that we make from the home budget that we make to the calendar that we make for our time to our priorities of what it is that we live for, to what we watch on TV, anything, everything will be affected because we now live in the context of the kingdom of God. I mean, it reminds me of, of uh, what we're dealing with today. You see, in, in our part of the world, you don't go outside without putting on a mask. We carry them everywhere. Even in our office, we have to wear them if we are not outside of our, if we're outside of our, uh, our office uh, cubicle itself. When we go to the grocery store, when we get on the bus, no matter what we do, we have to wear this mask. And I'll be honest with you, I do not like wearing the mask. First of all, it always uh, fogs up my glasses. Secondly, I feel like I'm breathing through a sock. It's hard to get my breath. But I know that it's useful. I understand what it is. But this COVID-19 pandemic has affected everything about our life. We, I wash my hands so many more times than I used to. I, I, we have the, the little hand sanitizers everywhere. No matter where you go here in Hong Kong, almost every store, grocery store, they have the hand sanitizers. They want everybody using them. And you have to put on the masks. And sometimes people even have shields over their face. And uh, you have to sit. In, in restaurants and other things, uh, two meters apart, and keep that social distancing. And like you, and uh, now is from what I understand, and, and here in our part of the world, all across China, and here in Hong Kong, Macau, the churches are closed, and everything is done virtually through these kind of platforms. It affects everything. Because, because why? Can I see those, those coronaviruses? Can I see them with my naked eye? But yet it's affected my entire life. It's affected how I shop, where I go, how I eat, what I wear. Why? Because I know, I believe, I see the evidence that there are these little critters out there called coronaviruses, COVID-19, and that in order for me to be protected against them, I gotta wear this mask, I've gotta do these things. Do you see how the unseen has affected the seen? It's the same way with the kingdom of God. Brothers and sisters, we need to let the kingdom of God fully, fully consume us. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who gave his life for the cause of Christ, reminds us that there is no such thing as a half Christian. He reminds us that salvation is free, but discipleship will cost you your life. Salvation is free, praise God. But if you're going to follow Jesus, he requires everything of you. Everything, if you're going to be his disciple. If you're going to go into the kingdom of God, you can enter freely by his grace and you can have that assurance of salvation. But if you're going to follow Jesus, you must daily sing the song, All to Jesus I Surrender. It will cost you your life and everything that you do, that you think. Reminds me of Pastor Way. It's not his real name. He'd been repeatedly arrested and beaten for his faith in my part of the world here in China. His congregation met at a home and constantly was forced to move from place to place, from location to location. 
on the police had threatened him time and time again after arresting him to stop his kingdom work. Stop growing the kingdom. They promised that they would leave him alone if he would just simply conform, if he would just stop talking about Jesus. What amazed me about his story was that, uh, is that once while he was leading in a house church service, the authorities barged in, they arrested him, and they were, as they were hauling him off to jail, he stopped the police and said, excuse me, can I please take my bag with me? And they became curious and they said, what is this bag about? They went and grabbed the bag and they looked inside, ruffled through it, and there was nothing but a change of clothes. You see, Pastor Way had assumed, had prepared himself that most likely when he left home, he would not go back home. When he went to, the, to this church service to lead in the things of the kingdom, he would most likely be arrested and he would go to jail and be beaten. So he said, I might as well bring a, a change of clothes. But what really struck me about this is, why would you go to church and lead out when you know that you will be beaten, that you know that you would suffer? Why not just conform? And the answer was simply this, because the king was so precious to Pastor away. Because the cause of Christ was so compelling and all pervasive in his life that he would never, ever give up living in this kingdom of God and working to expand this kingdom. The reality of Jesus was greater than the reality of suffering physically and emotionally for the cause of Christ. You see, dear brothers and sisters, the call of your master is not just to serve him one day in seven, to not just render him one dollar out of ten, but he is calling you to give him all of your time, to give him all of your resources, to offer him all of your talents, all of you fully baptized, all of you fully immersed in this invisible kingdom called the kingdom of God. If we have the wrong worldview, we are going in the wrong direction. But if we have the right spiritual worldview, we will have a journey in life that will be wrought with some challenges, maybe persecutions, maybe pain, but we will have a life. We will enjoy a journey with a purpose and with a companion who said he will never leave us nor forsake us. Jesus Christ, our Lord. How are you today with Jesus? I just pray that you will have and that you will be immersed in this worldview of the kingdom of God, that everything that you do, that everything that you think, that everything that you offer will be offered for the cause of Christ. Jesus gave everything for you. Shall we not in turn live joyfully in his kingdom? As we are living now at the time of the end, as we know that we are entering into probably an unprecedented time of turmoil, I don't know what the future holds, and it really doesn't matter because as the saying goes, I know who holds the future because Jesus will be walking with me if I live in the worldview of the kingdom of God. If I live in the worldview, oh, I've got to do this and this, and I've got to look this way and that way in this, the visible world, then I will be stranded. I will feel hopeless. I will feel lost. But when you walk with Jesus and you expand his kingdom, when you walk with the king of the kingdom of righteousness, you are never lost. You know where you're going and you have a clear destination. And that is to see Jesus face to face very soon. Please commit today to surrender all to him. Commit today to live in the reality and joy of the universe next door. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for Jesus. He is the center of our faith. He is our hope. He is our present help. He is our companion. He is the king of the kingdom he came to proclaim. And Lord, forgive us when we have forgotten or 
the kingdom of God has been clouded by the things around us. At this time and this place, at this moment, Lord, all of us here, we want to say, Jesus, open our eyes. Unplug our ears. Let us see the spiritual realities of the great controversy. And may we daily, Lord, help us daily to be filled with your Holy Spirit so that we will live a life fully dedicated to you as our Lord and Savior and to the mission of Christ to expand the good news of Jesus to every kindred, tongue, and nation. Thank you for walking with us. Thank you for giving us hope. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. May God bless you and uh, walk with you every single day, and he will. I know you were blessed by that message, so be sure not to miss Elder Falkenberg's final message this evening. It's an appropriate close to our online camp meeting. It's titled, Our Blessed Hope. I'll look forward to having you back here in just a few hours at 6 p.m. Central, 7 p.m. Eastern. And now, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God's called us to surrender, to give everything to him, to surrender all to the kingdom. We're all ambassadors of Jesus Christ. That's who we, that's who we are. And he's called us to be that. What a great opportunity that is. So um, I think that was a timely message for us. Um, be sure to tune in tonight at 7 o'clock Eastern time. Um, I'll go ahead and post to the church forum the, um, the final camp meeting message for this evening as um, Dr. Robert Falkenberg Jr. Um, brings us the final message. Um, just don't forget today at 4.30, we're going to be doing the caravan baby shower for Mike and uh, Donna Ray. Um, we'll be meeting at, let's see, we'll be meeting at 4.15 at the very, at the very latest, 4.15 um, at the Huntington Bank off of exit 175, the Richwood exit. Um, so if you want to be involved in that, bring your gift, uh, bring, bring your smiles. We know that Mike and Donna Ray and the family would love to see, to see you there, to see their church family there supporting them as they, as they welcome their, their new baby here in, 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 just, uh, in just, uh, just a short while. So um, we'll, 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 see you, we'll see you there in a, in a, in a few hours. But uh, let's go ahead and close up with a word of prayer, and then, um, and then uh, we'll just transition to our, our closing music. Heavenly Father, we, we want to thank you so much, Lord, for the blessings that you've given us today. Thank you for a beautiful Sabbath. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity that we have to continue to worship with you, albeit virtually, but still we are together, Lord. Um, we are together worshiping with you um, um, and with our, our brothers and sisters. We ask, Father, that you guide us and direct us in all that we do today. Watch over us, Lord, and we just especially want to pray for um, Donna Ray and Mike, Lord, as, as they have their, their baby coming into the world soon, and we just pray, Father, for their protection and for the baby's health and for everything to go well there. We love you, Jesus. Bless us today in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, family. Well, God bless, and we'll see you in a few hours.